I think we will be starting. Uh, welcome to this Rat Pack non blocking live coding session. And uh, before we start, let uh, me ask a simple question. How many of you have any uh, hands on experience with Rat Pack? Only Jeff. That's a very nice situation because you, you, have, you, have, you have chosen the right uh, talk to be to, uh, today here. This is a practical quick start with a very strong accent on the squeak part. Okay, so we will be moving pretty fast uh, because I want to jump in uh, pretty quickly to this non-blocking part. We will wrote a web application right from the beginning so we will see how it, uh, how it is created and uh, this application is already on GitHub, so don't worry if the pace is too fast. Uh, later on, you can just go to GitHub and see the code, analyze it in your own pace. But from this talk, I would like you to take away three things. First one is, I would like you to, to um, learn how to bootstrap a simple Ratpack web application. You will see tools like Gradle, you will see LazyBones, uh, you will see how we can uh, prototype a Redpack application. And when we move to this non-blocking part, you will see what uh, traps are hidden behind this approach. Because I assume most of us uh, develop a blocking application for, for most of the time. Like 80% um, of web applications I did in my career were actually blocking uh, applications. And uh, in the end, I hope this presentation will give you an answer to the question when to use and when to consider this non-blocking approach. Because it's not like a silver bullet to all uh, our problems, but there are some specific use cases where we can actually benefit from moving to a non-blocking mm, approach. So my name is Shimon Stempniak, and I'm a huge Ratpack enthusiast. I wrote a f actually a few uh, blog posts about Ratpack on my blog, ePrint Stacktrace blog. On a daily basis, I work as a continuous delivery architect at Upwork. Uh, any one of you use Upwork? Any freelancers here? Sandra? Uh, and of course, I support my local community. I'm a Torun uh, Torun Java user group founder. I also use Twitter. If you uh, want to um, follow me, please use this handle. So before we jump into the live coding session, let me mm, explain some context behind this demo. So let's assume we have the following uh, architecture. We have a very simple product service. That's a microservice that exposes a single endpoint. We just ask for a product with a given ID, and it just returns an information about this product. No, only uh, read information, no uh, updating products, no creating products, etc. But Let's think about this product service not as a simple mapper from query string to some SQL uh, data uh, database query. Let's think for a second that this product service is actually something like proxy. So when we ask for a specific product, we are always interested in the most recent information. So this product service re uh, asks for this information, let's say, to three or even more remote um, external services. Sometimes maybe it can read data from a file system, and we use this to justify huge latencies that we will uh, see uh, in a product service. Some products will, uh, will return pretty quickly. Some of them uh, will require something like one and a half seconds to, to, to give us an answer. And we don't use caching because we always want to have the most recent, the fresh information. And at the same time, we have something like recommendation service. Forget about recommendations engines. We won't uh, focus about that. In our case, this is like a fake mock recommendation service. We will hard code five product IDs in this um, recommendation service because what interests us most is this communication. Because when recommendation service recommends, let's say, free products to our customers, then it has to perform free HTTP requests to product service. If we have to uh, recommend five uh, products, we have to perform those five requests. There is no like a products with given ID, so uh, we always stick to uh, this n number of HTTP requests. This is pretty simple. Uh, for simplicity, I will just close uh, this whole architecture in a single 
uh, Ratpack application, so we won't jump between different IntelliJ ideas. We will just, for simplicity, keep it in a single application, but we, we will connect this recommendation service with product ser service over HTTP. So at any point, we can just split it into two microservices, okay? So let's start the fun part. Uh, there is nothing created yet, so we will start with a completely clean folder, and I will use LazyBones to create a Redpack application. And let's call it Redpack Great Conf Demo. Uh, how many of you use LazyBones? Okay, we have some users. This is a great tool uh, made by Peter Pete Ledbrook, and it allow you to it allows you to bootstrap many mm, groovy related uh, projects. So we have this Ratpack Great Conf demo. If we take a look uh, at its source code, this is just like a default Ratpack Groovy application. One thing worth mentioning: Ratpack does not require Groovy. You can use Java 8 and you can uh, develop Ratpack applications, but this LazyBone tem template it uses Ratpack Groovy integration. So let's go to this folder and we will. It also it's shipped with Gradle, so we will use uh, Gradle wrapper, and we will just simply call uh, Gradle idea to generate idea project. Okay, it has been generated, and now let's open it in IntelliJ IDEA. Here we have the folder, here it is. Okay, let me switch to presentation mode so you can see it in a huge font size. Okay, so here we have clean Redpack application. Redpack Groovy starts with this entry point called Redpack Groovy. I'll just delete this one. Think of it as the heart of our Redpack Groovy application. Right now we have some markup template module mm, configured here. We have a single uh, get handler. But let's start with uh, preparing our product service. For product service we will need some domain class, so let's quickly create product domain entity. This will be a very simple class which has ID, it has name, and it has price. Only those three uh, properties, okay? And for this product, we will create an interface, product service. And I created it only because I want to show you uh, what the dependency injection in Redpack, what does it look like, okay? So our Product service interface will expose a single method called find product by ID. Okay. We wrote such methods many times before. This is nothing. Th th this is not the rocket science. So we have this interface, and let's implement this interface. I will use something called fake remote product service. I call it fake remote because all products that we will be using in this application they will they will be stored in the memory. So we'll use a concurrent hash map here, but uh, we will simulate those latencies I mentioned earlier on the slides. So to simulate this latency, I will create a simple method that returns not a product, it will create not a product, but supplier of product. I use supplier functional interface because I want to encapsulate this latency simulation inside uh, the body of this function. So instead of returning a product, we will be always returning this function. So whenever we ask for a specific product, the body will be performed. And let's call this method product with fake latency. We will pass a product and latency as an integer. And the whole uh, method looks like this. We return a supplier of product. Come on. And here what we do? Thread slip. And we just return a product. So whenever we want to return specific product, this thread slip jumps in, it will simulate latency, and we are ready to go. Now let me quickly generate a map of products. So here we have uh, five products, five books actually, 
uh, learning graph pagnetti in action, micronode in action. It's not yet written, but I hope it will show up uh, soon enough. Groovy in action, code complete, and take a look at those latencies. So the first book has 80 milliseconds latency. Here we have 110, 600, 1200, and code complete actually blocks for uh, half a, uh, one and a half second. These are the, those latencies, okay? So now when we go back to this, we need to implement this find product by ID in our fake uh, remote product service. What do we do? We just go to this products map. We use get or default because it is possible that we will request for a product that does not exist. So we pass this ID. If product with given ID does not exist, I just return an empty supplier because I want to safely call get method. So we return a product, we always hit this latency in this method. If uh, product with given ID does not exist, I just accept that I will return a null. Okay, now let's open this Ratpack Groovy mm, file. And here we will just clean it up, we will remove, this is not needed right now. So let's make a, a dependency injection. Ratpack uses juice. Uh, as a dependency injection container. And in this section called bindings, we can instruct Ratpack that whenever I want to inject uh, an, impl an implementation of product service, I will inject this fake remote product service. This is what I want to do. Uh, this is what I want uh, Juice to take care of. In the handlers section, here we have all our uh, handlers. You can think ab uh, about handler. It's not specifically controller from MVC, but for simplicity, think about uh, those handlers as controllers. They technically something completely different, but uh, for simplicity, let's uh, make this assumption. And in handlers, we have very useful methods like post, get, we have delete. So you see that uh, it, they refer to uh, HTTP methods, okay? So let's use a get method called products with some ID. And one way to specify a handler is, for instance, I can pass a closure. And in this closure, I can just specify body of my handler. And the good thing about Ratpack Groovy is that I can specify that this closure expects a single parameter, product service. And Ratpack will handle injection of this fake product service in place here. So what do we do? Usually, we do something like this. We call product service, find uh, product by ID. I need to pass the ID. There is this path tokens helper object, and it just maps to um, those, those tokens in, in my path. So dot ID actually refers to the ID uh, coming from the uh, URL path. Okay, and what do we do? We usually do if product, in Groovy we can just do if product, if it exists, we will just render it as JSON object. Let's import this method. Okay. And otherwise, we will just render a very simple message not found. And let's also set a 404 status for this application. Our handler is ready. Let's see how it uh, runs. I use Gradle run uh, task in cool feature called continuation mode. I just started this application, and until uh, the end of this presentation, I, I won't restart my application. Gradle will handle all, all hot swapping, so all changes I will make, I will add new handler, I will do some small refactoring, and all these changes will be automatically, it takes something like uh, 50 milliseconds to restart uh, in this case, so we will have this very uh, rapid experience here. I use HTTP uh, as a HTTP client, and let's see if we can get some product. Nothing fancy, learning Ratpack returned. If we ask for um, clean co uh, co uh, code complete, sorry, it took uh, one and a half second, and of course, if I ask for a product that does not, does, that does not exist, I get this message not found. Okay, but if you heard anything about Ratpack, it's quite popular uh, to, to hear that Ratpack can run on a single thread. Let's see how it goes. In the server config section, I can specify how many threads exist in so-called Ratpack compute thread pool. This is a thread pool that controls how many event loops we have. So in this case, 
we will have a single event loop that is responsible for handling all incoming requests, and in this case also uh, to handle all operations. I will also turn off development uh, just uh, for purpose of this demo, and let's see if anything changed. Okay, it works, but let's see what happens after switching to a single um, thread. Let's see how our application handles multiple requests at the same time. Let's use Siege tool to perform multiple requests, and we will ask for a product uh, with ID free. And as you can see, our application is not able to handle those requests in parallel because we have a single thread. And what we have implemented here uh, is completely blocking fashion because when this first request um, that was performed by Siege goes here, it just waits free, uh, 600 milliseconds to get the, the response. So our application is just blocking. It doesn't do anything at that moment because it uses only this one thread. And let's maybe open jconsole to see this thread pool. And this should be it. If, let's see. I will make it bigger. Yes, this is one. So if we filter rat pack threads, you can see that we have this single rat pack compute thread in the thread pool. And we can do better. We can just switch from blocking application to a non-blocking one with just a small effort. And let's see how we, can, how, how we can achieve that. First of all, we need to change our interface. So instead of returning a, a, a product, we will start returning a promise of a product. And for simplicity, you can think about promises as older brother or sister of completable future. This is the promise that there will be some value at some point of time, but you don't know when this value occurs. Okay? It, it may be returned immediately, or it may be uh, um, a wrapper for an asynchronous call, so your response will get back at some point of time. Okay, we changed this uh, to a promise. Now we need to, of course, change this one. So we will return this promise of, of a product. Okay, prototype is changed. What about body? And there are multiple ways we can uh, uh, create a promise. There are helper functions like uh, you can create just a promise of value. It will return immediately a value. You can control asynchronously. We could create an executor service. We could create our own thread pool and control which operations are handled uh, by this thread pool. But Ratpack comes with this very handy and recommended way, which is we could use blocking class, and there is this helper method co called get. And this method will return a promise that performs operation on a ver specific thread pool called Ratpack blocking. So let's see how it works. We will return this promise here, and if we take a look at the prototype of this method, we will see that it actually returns promise of some type T. Okay. And let's just move this part. Okay, maybe we can re return, remove this return. Okay, so we have our uh, fake remote service uh, refactored. Now we need to change, of course, uh, the handler implementation because right now here we expect some product and our find product by ID now suddenly returns a promise instead. The only part that remains the same is this one, so we need to remove this and how to operate with promises. If you, do you have any experience with completable futures or, or promises in JavaScript? How many of you? Okay, some, some of you have this experience. So in this case, we will be just chaining some operations. So for instance, this, uh, for use case where our fake remote product service returns a null, we can attach a function with on a null method. This is the method or function that will be triggered when uh, the null value is returned. So what happens in this case? Well, we set status 404, and we simply render JSON object uh, with message not found here. Okay, but we also need so-called termination method, and there is a specific method called then, and this method will terminate our promise, and it, it will be the block uh, of this method will be executed when the value is 
available at some point of time. So this then will provide us the product uh, coming from this method find product by ID. So in this case, we can do what we did earlier. So we will just render this product as JSON. Okay, I don't restart this application. Gradle is still running. Gradle handles uh, what happens. And let's run this query again. The difference is huge. Now these 10 requests were handled in parallel. And uh, let's take a look at JConsole to see what happened. And as you can see here, we still, uh, this Redpack compute remains uh, a single thread, but now suddenly 10 Redpack blocking threads uh, were created from this Redpack blocking thread pool. So thanks to this, what happened if we take a look at our method, so from our method perspective, when this uh, find product by ID, it just immediately returned a promise. Here, we just attached the behavior, what happens if the null value comes uh, from the promise. And here we terminated, like we, here we triggered this promise and we just said, okay, render JSON product when the value comes in. And this Redpack compute thread, it was already after, I think less than one millisecond, actually, it was ready to handle next HTTP uh, incoming request. So that's the whole magic behind non-blocking. There is no magic here. This is just like a performing specific blocking operations on this Redpack blocking tool because the, the core rule of thumb is that Redpack compute thread pool, it shouldn't never block. It, it is designed only for computations, for handling incoming requests, whatever blocking operation is like a database query, like HTTP connection, like maybe you can read something from file system, these kind of operations should be performed on this blocking thread pool. And before we move into recommendations, uh, let's do a small refactoring because uh, you can imagine that uh, if I would create like uh, this recommendations handler here, it becomes nasty, like, all business logic in a single file, it smells dirty. So let's make a small refactoring. We can extract the body of this handler to a handler class and how to do it. Let's create here a product handler class. And we need to remember to implement handler from Redpack handling, not one of those many handler, uh, uh, two uh, interfaces here, that are these are the classes. And we implement handle method. Now we can go back to Redpack Groovy. I just cut it from here. Can go back here. We just paste it here. And we need to satisfy those uh, fields or lo local variables that are not, uh, uh, that are not resolved. So first of all, we need to inject product service we will do constructor injection, and we use just Java X inject um, annotation. Juice will handle um, injection of a correct product service here. So one thing is satisfied, and now all these things like path tokens, we just need to explicitly call these methods on the context object. Okay, so handler class is ready. What do we need to do next? First of all, we need to inform Juice to handle creation of this product handler class for us. And because product service is also defined in uh, Juice context, it will inject uh, the proper implementation. And here I just say product handler, and that's it. Let's see if it, if it works. Uh, we can do some yeah, everything works as expected. And just to show you that adding this file actually did this hot swapping, let me create uh, this recommendations handler. Our class here, we will bind it. And with empty body, we will see uh, how it behaves. Okay, so the empty recommendations handler is ready. Let's bind it here. Basically, the cool one of the one of the things I really love in Redpack is that it's very explicit. No 
component scanning, no runtime magic. It's just I have to explicitly, when I have to reason about the program, I can simply see uh, which, uh, for instance, uh, um, dependencies are injected and so forth. And now, when we specify handler path for recommendations, we will just pass it here. And now let's try to call this method. 500 internal server error, so no 404, so something, actually our server returns something. And here we can see that uh, the error is that no response was set, sent. So our recommendations handler is visible to our application, but because it didn't return any value, it didn't terminate um, handler processing, that's why we end up with 500 server error here. So let's go back to our recommendations handler and let's implement this fake business logic of uh, recommendations uh, service. Let's start with defining uh, the stack final list of IDEs we want to recommend to all users. There is no user context, we just always return the same five products in our recommendation system. And let's return it in the following order, maybe four, one, two, and now five and two, in this order. So we will be trying to recommend these uh, five products. And we, what we need to do is we need to uh, open HTTP connection for every product. Uh, Ratpack comes with very handy uh, asynchronous HTTP client, which we can inject to our code, I'll call it HTTP, and I will also add well-known object mapper from FasterXML Jackson library. Because uh, when, we re when we receive the response coming from HTTP client, we need to map it to product um, object. Okay, let's create a constructor. Let's inject dependencies from juice. And now if we take a look at this HTTP client, we can see that it has those handy methods like get, which prepares HTTP get request. And you can see that what kind of value it returns. It returns, it returns promise of something called received response. So because we will, be, we will try to mm, map all these IDs to those HTTP uh, connections, let's create a helper method that will create for us this promise of received response. Prepare HTTP connection. And I will just pass the ID of a given product. Because we are, we are doing a demo, so we can this URI, I can just simply do HTTP localhost 5050 products. No discovery client, as you can see, just a very simple manual approach here we will do the URI from it. So we have this method that prepares, and the, f the cool thing about this client is that I create this promise, so, but no HTTP connection is yet triggered. We will have to trigger all promises uh, before any HTTP connection gets triggered. So if we create this list of promises, what we can do is we can get this list of strings and we are at a great conf, so we know groovy code pretty well. We can use collect method that maps every ID to this mm, promise of received response. So what we end up with is we have a list of promise of received responses. And uh, we can do better. Promise uh, API is very, um, very handy. So for instance, what we can do with promises, we can call methods like map. So we can get the one value, one type of a value, and we can map it to other type. And in our case, this can be pretty useful because what we can do is we can map this receive the response to a final product type. And we can even do better because we can use map if. This is a specific variant of this map method where it, uh, the first parameter is the predicate. We will say what is the correct response in our case, and it will apply two different uh, methods, two different uh, map mapping functions, depending on the, the predicate. So in our case, the predicate is quite simple. We just want, we accept any successful 
um, returns. And in case of uh, correct, uh, correct response status, what we will do is we will use this object mapper, read value method, and read the value method expects, for instance, um, input stream. So let take, let's take this input stream from response body, input stream, and let's map it to our product object, okay? This is uh, what happens if the uh, response is successful, and otherwise, any 404, 500, things like that, we just accept that we will return nulls. That's our contract, we are fine with that. Of course, our return just signals that uh, we have to return uh, the received response is not uh, valid anymore. In this case, we just use promise of product. So what we have here is we have a list of promises of products. Now, the main question is how to trigger all those promises. Uh, we could do something like each, we could take this promise, and inside we could apply something like this then function, but uh, this would be very, uh, actually, bad choice. We can process tho those promises in a more like a batch way. Uh, let's use, let's start with a serial batch, and I will just pass all these promises, and we will do the following. We will yield the value, so we will wait until we have the promise of all, list of all products, and when it happens, we get a list of products here, so we can simply do render as JSON as it was before, and take a look, the products is already a list of products. Perfect. Without restarting the application, let's see how this endpoint works. I'll just trigger it, we wait. Okay. Uh, response was returned. It was returned in the same order as you can see, three, four, one, five, and two. But let's just take a look how much time did it take. Because it was quite long. We will use Siege just to get this information about uh, the timing. Three and a half seconds. And why is that? We used serial batch. And serial batch processes all promises one after another. So it has to wait until the first pro uh, promise was uh, processed, then it uh, takes the one. So this three and a half, this is actually a sum of all latencies we define in our fake re uh, remote um, product service. Instead, we can do just parallel batch. And as the name suggests, it just processes all uh, promises in parallel. It doesn't wait until the first uh, promise was uh, completed. It just does it in a uh, parallel fashion. So it took one and a half second because uh, this code complete takes one and a half second uh, latency. The same order as we can see here, and uh, we are uh, we are done with this. But at some point of time, someone from marketing team comes to us and says. Look, uh, one and a half seconds, this is a pretty huge amount of time. No one actually uses those recommendations because people already scroll down to the footer uh, uh, before those recommendations shows up. And they made some scientific research, and let's say they define that we have to return anything in um, uh, 500 milliseconds uh, period of time. Okay, uh, challenge accepted. Let's do some small modifications to our code. So what we can do is this HTTP client, the get method, it has a second uh, optional parameter, uh, which is the action of requests uh, specification. With this parameter, we can use a closure to sp add some um, uh, specific uh, options to our request. And one of them is we can set a read timeout. And let's say we will set it up to 500 milliseconds as our marketing, uh, marketing team asks, uh, asked us. Okay, let's see what happens. 500 internal server error, okay. Uh, what happened? And what uh, happened? Did the read timeout happen, actually? But the problem was that we didn't specify any error handler. So the default behavior here is that it will just uh, throw this exception and nothing is returned. Okay, let's deal with that. Uh, as we know, promises have these reactive-like fluent API, so there is, of course, a method called onError, and for simplicity, for this demo, we will just print line an error message, okay? Gradle restarted. 
let's run. Voila, we have two products that match the given time output. We have some nulls. And of course, if we take a look at the Gradle console output, we see there is this read timeout exception, uh, error message, sorry, uh, here. So let's deal with those nulls uh, firstly. We can always replace this yield with accessing a transformable publisher. And with its toolist method, it will actually, this combination will filter all nulls. So we end up only with those values that we are interested in. Of course, this error still exists because products three, four, and five, they don't uh, match this timeout we set, so they will still fail. And we could say that, okay, uh, we met this expectation if we call, let's say, 100 parallel request, requests, recommendations, we see that, or maybe let's start with one so we can see uh, how much time does one take. It takes approximately, as you can see here, uh, one uh, half a second, so we are, we are okay. But the problem is that, and that's one of the, 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 this is the first trap we need to be aware of. We set this read timeout on the client side. It means that when this recommendations handler uh, performs this HTTP request, after half a second, it says, okay, I'm done. I, I, I'm, not uh, I'm not waiting for the response, but the server is still processing. So for instance, this, this code complete that takes um, uh, 1,500 uh, uh, milliseconds, it is still pro it's still processing. So we are still blocking. And basically, if we take a look, if we trigger, let's say, 1,000 parallel requests, you see that bytes, the, the size of the response changes, because sometimes our two products that fit in the, the, the timeout, they also started uh, reaching the read timeout. And basically, 1,000 uh, parallel requests means that our single Ratpack application handles 6,000, because we have one request per recommendations, an additional five uh, per every product to the same application. Uh, and this might be pretty problematic because we waste uh, resources for handling requests that never reach uh, this, this timeout and they always fail. How we can prevent such situations? And there are m multiple ways uh, to do it. And one way we can do is we can add Resilience4j. And let's stop. This is the first time we stop this application. And let's go to Build Gradle. And I will add here async this resilience for J mm, dependencies. I have to add metrics, Prometheus, user metrics, because otherwise uh, this version will fail uh, at compilation time. So we have resilience for J added, Gradle refreshed, and what we can do with this resilience for J. And the simplest use case is fairly simple. Let's get back to Ratpack Groovy. And with this binding section, because we use juice, we are also, uh, we, what we can do is we can attach any existing juice module. So for instance, this resilience for j Ratpack starter comes with resilience for j module. If we take a look what it does, it just binds some interceptors, it just creates some default registries for us. So this is the things we want to and configure in our application. And from this perspective, we only add this a single module. Now let's go back to recommendations handler. And with this resilience for J, let me explain one thing. We want to use a circuit breaker pattern. Uh, what circuit, uh, circuit breaker pattern is that our, we want to uh, give our application a chance to monitor how many requests, how many calls the specific service fail. And we will use default values, which means that if 50% of 100 first calls to product service to for specific product fails, this circuit will open. It means that our application will stop sending any requests. It will just assume that this service fails constantly, and we just want to drop uh, um, any HTTP requests to, the, to this service. So how we can do it with Ratpack? We will add circuit breaker registry here, and we can just inject it as a um, dependency to this class. Let's add it to constructor. 
Free parameters and constructor, it doesn't look good, but uh, I think with the demo we are justified. And the cool thing with uh, promises is that we can use this method called transform. And this transform method allows us to transform existing promise to some other promise. And we want to make a promise that is circuit breaker aware. How to do it? Resilience4j comes with this circuit breaker transformer. And we can just, uh, wh what it ex expects is it expects some circuit breaker. We want to create a unique circuit breaker for every um, request. Because if we create a unique cir uh, circuit breaker that is shared between all those requests, the first request that fail and opens a uh, circuit breaker would end up that any um, HTTP request cannot be triggered. So let's get um, from registry, you can create or uh, we could define a circuit breaker, but we didn't uh, define anyone. So we will uh, simply create a circuit breakers associated with product ID. So we will have five circuit breakers. And actually this transformation is all we need to make our promises circuit breaker aware. So let's run application again. And let's see if the circuit breaker works for us. So we will start with sending a single recommendations, uh, but I will use Siege because I want to show you I want to show you how much time uh, does it take. So regular call, circuit breaker, all cir circuit breakers are closed. So all HTTP requests are triggered. And as you can see here, again, half in a second, uh, ha half a second, uh, this is the uh, request time. And let's see what happens when we trigger 100 requests. And let's see what happens now. So now we, act we met this requirement that 50% of 100 calls to those three, for those three products failed. So if we run uh, another call, take a look at this number. 130 milliseconds, because now circuit breaker, if we go, uh, go here, doo -doo 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 -doo, uh, says that circuit breaker for product three, four, and five is open, and it will remain open for uh, 60 seconds. This is configurable so we can mm, open circuit breakers for a longer period th than that. Anyway, right now I can do something like this. I can call 1,000 requests. There was some small um, uh, 28 bytes returned, but basically this, this circuit breaker for those free products is still open, so our application does not wait, waste any resources to trigger these requests. And there are like uh, many different ways we could uh, make our application fault tolerant. We could add some for some products, we could add some caching. We could uh, basically we what we should do is we should add here instead of print, uh, print lining error message, it would be much better if we capture some metrics using drop wizard metrics for instance so we can see at some point of time we can get information that uh, this specific product it constantly open circuit breaker. So at some point of time, uh, with this requirement of uh, 500 milliseconds, we would come into uh, agreement that we don't need these two and this one. So at some point of time, we could just make our application aware of this situation and we could, uh, in many different ways, we could limit how many uh, products we are trying to recommend to our, our users. And if it comes to this demo, this is actually what I prepared for you. And let's make some short summary. So first thing worth remembering, Ratpack Compute Threat Pool is designed for computations only. We should leave this uh, event loop, single event loop, or if we use more threads than, than, than just a single thread, we should just keep for computations only. And all blocking operations, there is this Ratpack blocking uh, thread pool. It's designed for those blocking operations. It's, v as, as, you, uh, as you've seen, it's, pre it's pretty simple to perform those operations on a blocking thread pool. You can use your own executor service, you can use your own thread pool using different, uh, like, promise async mm, operations. And this promise type, this is your friend to actually wrap all these asynchronous um, expectations. So you can use it for immediately values, you can use it for asynchronous calls as well. 
And we still need to remember about fault tolerance, especially when we start dealing with uh, timeouts. Timeouts are always pretty tricky. Here we used only a read timeout. There's also a connection timeout. When we combine both, uh, our application may behave completely different. It may, sti it may, it may start uh, reaching timeouts on connections because there is no event loop is uh, full of work and it cannot handle simple HTTP request. How many Micronaut fans out here? Okay, a bunch of you. Uh, I created the same example, except this Resilience 4J, because this is pretty a new uh, add-on to this, the, to this presentation. A few months ago, I wrote a three-part article about doing uh, Micronaut in this non-blocking and asynchronous manner. It uses pretty, pretty the same example, with explanation how those thread pools work in Micronaut, how to do the same. And you can just, you can Google it, Micronaut async, you will find it on top, or you can go uh, to my blog. And all this application is already on GitHub. You will find some useful resources uh, there as well. I will add later today uh, a few more links, so you can, if you are interested in uh, learning more about Ratpack, you can read learning Ratpack, or you can just learn Ratpack uh, different way. So that's all from my side. Thank you. And do you have any questions? Yes. Mm hmm. Okay, so the question is how to test those promises. You don't have to mock them. Basically, with Ratpack, you have this exec harness uh, utility that you can, mm, of course, uh, I if, we, if our application was like a microservice-like, so we have two separate uh, microservices running, we could use tools like WireMock to, to mock those, the, this communication in unit test. But in case of testing a single application in Ratpack, you can use exec harness, and you can, there's this utility that allows you to test in a unit, uh, unit kind matter, manner, application that starts up and boots up for your test. So all this HTTP communi communication, you don't have to mock it, like in case of this application, you, you can just, inside your unit test, you can simply run all these HTTP requests and you can make some assumptions on those promises using exec harness tool. I will add a link because a uh, year and a half when I firstly uh, make this presentation, there is still a, a repository on GitHub. I mixed some because it was uh, designed for Java user groups, so there was some Groovy and Java code. In this repository, you will find unit tests that show how to test in, a, in an integra integration manner this kind of applications without mocking, just performing HTTP requests to this application. Okay, no more questions once again. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.